Hello everyone, I'm Nitin and in this Vector Clocks video, I'll be discussing basics of Vector Clock, Clock conditions and rules for different types of events, and limitations of Vector Clock. So let's get started. A Vector Clock is a logical clock used to determine the order of events in a distributed system. It does not measure time and is an improvement on Lamport's clock. Instead of holding only one time stem of its own node or process, each vector clock holds a vector of time stems, including a time stem for each node or process. The time stem or counter in the vector is incremented or updated when a new event occurs on a node or process. It captures not only the happened before relationship, but also the causal relationship between events. I have explained both relationships in detail in the ordering of events video. You can find the link in the description below. Let's look at an example of vector clocks using the typical space-time diagram of a distributed system. Here we have got three nodes or processes P, Q and R having 4, 5 and 3 events respectively. Unlike a single time stamp in a Lamport's clock, here, each event is stamped with a vector of time stamps, one for each node or process. Initially, all the time stamps in the vector are set to zero. Each node increments its own time stamp and updates other time stamps in the vector when a new event occurs. The rule to increment values of time stamps is dependent on the type of event, whether it is a local event or received message event will have a more in-depth look later on. When a node sends a message, the entire vector is sent with that message in order to keep vector clocks in synchronization. Now we are going to discuss two conditions and rules for incrementing a vector clock. First condition and rule for local events. So each node increments its own timestamp or counter in the vector by one. When a new local or internal event occurs on that node. However, other nodes timestamps remain unchanged in the vector. A sent message event is also a local event and a timestamp is incremented in the same way. For example, the initial value of the vector clock on the node P is 0 and when a new local event P1 has occurred, only the local timestamp of the node P is incremented. Next, P2 has occurred locally after P1 and the local timestamp value is 1. Therefore, it will be 2 for P2. Here the local timestamp is incremented by 1. And if P1 happened before P2, then the timestamp of P1 is less than the timestamp of P2, which is the case here. Similarly, the local timestamp will be incremented for each subsequent event on the node P. On the node Q, when a new local event Q1 has occurred, only the local timestamp of the node Q is incremented. Similarly, the local timestamp will be incremented for each subsequent event on the node Q. On the node R, when a new local event R1 has occurred, only the local timestamp of the node R is incremented. Similarly, the local timestamp will be incremented for each subsequent event on the node R. The second condition and rule for external events or received messages. Here, I have modified this diagram to illustrate external events or received messages. When a message is received by any node which causes an event, then the node receiving the message increments its own timestamp in the vector by 1. It also updates each node's timestamp in the vector to the maximum value based on the value of that timestamp in the local vector and received vector. Let's look at some examples. P3 is a received message event on the node P and for updating the vector clock at this received message event P3, we need to increment the value of the local timestamp of P by 1 in the vector. Then update other nodes timestamps in the vector based on the maximum value from local timestamp and receive timestamp of the corresponding nodes. So, let's look at how we update the timestamps of other nodes Q and R. For updating the timestamp of node Q, 
compare the time stamps of q in the local vector and received vector here the value of the time stamp of q is 0 in the local vector and 2 in the received vector therefore the time stamp of q is updated by the maximum value of 2 for updating the time stamp of node r compare the time stamps of r in the local vector and received vector here the value of the time stamp of r is 0 in both local vector and received vector therefore the time stamp of r is updated by the value 0 now let's look at the next event p4 on the node p which is the local event and only the local time stamp is incremented in the vector similarly q3 is a received message event on the node q for updating the vector clock at this received message event q3 we need to increment the value of the local time stamp of q by 1 in the vector then compare the time stamps of p in the local vector and receive vector and update it by the maximum value from the 2 similarly compare the time stamps of r in the local vector and receive vector and update it by the maximum value from the 2 now let's look at the next event q4 on the node q which is the local event and only the local time stamp is incremented in the vector another event q5 is a received message event on the node q for updating the vector clock at this received message event q5 we need to increment the value of local time stamp of q by 1 in the vector then compare the time stamps of p in the local vector and receive vector and update it by the maximum value from the 2 similarly compare the time stamps of r in the local vector and receive vector and update it by the maximum value from the 2 finally an event r3 is a received message event on the node r for updating the vector clock at this received message event r3 we need to increment the value of the local time stamp of r by 1 in the vector then compare the time stamps of p in the local vector and receive vector and update it by the maximum value from the 2 similarly compare the time stamps of q in the local vector and receive vector and update it by the maximum value from the 2 now let's look at ordering of events using vector clock firstly happen before relationship for partial ordering of events an event a happens before b if and only if the vector clock of a is less than or equal to the vector clock of b for example an event q2 happened before p3 because the vector clock of q2 is less than or equal to the vector clock of p3 next concurrent events two events a and b are concurrent if and only if the vector clock of a is neither less than nor equal to the vector clock of b and vice versa for example two events p1 and q1 are concurrent because the time stamp of node p in the vector of p1 is neither less than nor equal to the time stamp of node p in the vector of q1 and the time stamp of node q in the vector of q1 is neither less than nor equal to the time stamp of node q in the vector of p1 we can also detect a causality violation using vector time stamps by comparing the time stamp of a newly received message to the local time stamp finally some limitations of the vector clock the vector clock consists of one entry per node that means it can potentially become very large for large systems the entire vector is sent with each message each time which increases communication overheads all vector elements have to be checked on every received message which increases processing overheads a variety of techniques have been applied to reduce the size of vector clocks for example either by performing periodic garbage collection or by reducing accuracy by limiting the size this concludes my presentation and thanks for watching my video